Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Emmy and Grammy winning superstar Lizzo, whose documentary Love Lizzo is currently streaming on Max. Now, I don't think anyone in the public would describe you as shy now, but talk about that girl named Melissa in the home video and how you felt at that time in your life. That, you know, the the coolest thing about this whole documentary process is I didn't have any videos of me when I was a kid. Like, you know, and I think that once we started doing research, one of my cousins was like, hey, you know, we've got like tons of VHS footage of you. And I was like, what? So wow. um, we got a bunch of like, you know, unseen, never before seen things even from me. So I felt transported when I saw that girl. I um, I had almost forgotten about her a little bit and was like, wow. I, I remember how like soft my voice was and I would always be like, leave me alone you know like <laughs> and um I think she was I was um very uncomfortable all the time you know and um I think my story has always been about just like creating a safe space for myself and creating space for myself period so, um for me to exist fully as myself and um I think that discomfort drove that a little bit Mm -hmm. And um, I, I still have moments of shyness, but I think that I interpret my shyness now as a sensitivity and a need to protect myself. And you were born in Detroit, Music City. So can you talk about how that community and particularly the church influenced you because you were exposed to some major gospel artists at a young age? Yes. Um, well, my mom, I think um, she went to the church with you know the wine ins and she grew up looking and singing with the Clark sisters and um I think I we grew up in the family church so I had the influence of of those and you know I, I was a baby at one of the wine ins wedding and they hailed me as a baby but um I think that my influence was gospel based but it was like my family like my cousins were playing uh, the drums and the bass and the keys and my cousins were all in the choir singing and um, it had probably the greatest influence on me as a live performer I think when you come to my shows and I see a lot of tweets now they'll be like that was a religious experience going to a Lizzo show is like church you know and even when my cousin uh, she came to my show she was like you know if you weren't a musician, you probably would have been like an evangelist or something because you got that voice of like, ah, you know, and uh, she's like, you know, it came out one way or the other. And um, I do think that music has the power to uh, make you feel something bigger than yourself. And, and um, catching the spirit is something that I feel like I did in church, but I also I can do it on stage. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I think that it, it, it my shows feel kind of like church. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, it's church for me. And uh, I get the chance to let it all out and say my message to the world. And Houston is home. That's where you really grew up. That's where you moved at a young age. Um, I love that moment in the documentary when you're so excited to play the Houston rodeo and then it's canceled yeah. because of COVID-19 and you just were devastated what did that mean for you? What was taken from you in that moment? And what is what did Houston hold for you? It's so funny because now it's a moment in a film, but that was like, you can't plan something yeah. like that. We were actually going to end the film at the Houston Rodeo. And it would have been my first stadium show, sold out in my hometown. And it would have been like the perfect finale. And we had been filming for years before that to get to this point. And all of a sudden, a day or two before this, the climax and ending of our film, it just wasn't happening anymore. And I think I wasn't thinking about that at the time either. I wasn't thinking about like, oh, no, our film doesn't have an ending. I was just like, huh? Mm -hmm. This virus is it has taken precedence over the world and this is something that we should not take lightly you know people were making jokes about 
you know, the virus back then and it was it people were a little bit more lighthearted about it. And for me, the rodeo being canceled was like, oh shit, what is gonna happen to the world? That is kind of where my mind was a little bit. And I was less in the man, this was supposed to be my moment. I don't think that I even process life like that because nothing in my life that has happened to me whether good or devastating has steered me wrong Mm -hmm. so I know that if something hasn't happened there's a divine reasoning and I need to move in that direction I don't ever fight the flow of my life so I knew that this just meant that some something transformative was going to happen and I needed to sit in it and just prepare for the next step. And you also talked about feeling different as a kid and then music became your passion, especially the flute at a young age. I mean, we don't get a lot of pop stars that start jamming out on the flute on stage. So that's something really unique and cool for you. What was, uh, what was it about the flutes and, you know, when, where did that passion come from with music? I've always had a passion for music as a as a kid growing up in church. However, I did not sing and I did not play any instruments. I just loved music. And um, when I joined my intermediate school in Houston, we had an incredible band director. And um, he would make band fun. He made band cool. And everyone wanted to be in band because of this one person, which, you know, there's the band nerd trope and all of that. And it's like, he made it like, you don't even think about that. Like all the cool kids wanted to be in band because of this particular teacher. And so I, um, by fate, I was in that room. And when they asked who wants to do flute or who should play flute, I was chosen um, out of everybody. And I think it was the first day we were blowing in the head joints because they took us to a separate room to learn flute because flute's a whole different beast than the other instruments. And we're, we're like, ooh, ooh, and like, I'm nailing it. I, I'm going, ooh, like, I'm nailing the head joint already. I'm like, oh, I'm good at this. And I'm faster than the other kids. I was picking up on things and I was getting bored easily. And I was like, what is this, you know, burning hunger? Like, I was like, okay, more. All right, then if the school doesn't have, like, the music that I want to play, let me go to um, Barnes & Nobles and see if I can find a CD or find some sheet music of songs I want to play. And so then I started to just, like, feed myself and and learn and teach myself. And I was like, I want to be the best flute player ever. (laughs) And I I just be, it, it was one of those, like, childish when you're a kid, you like, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be the best flute player ever. And you just kind of get obsessed with it. And I think that's kind of where it came from. Um, I just started to eat, breathe and and drink flute. And uh, the rest is history, I suppose. Like you never think these little things are going to amount to such greatness in your life. And it is literally like the reason why I'm here. <laughs> But you do really get into music and you get into rapping. And then the documentary takes us through the passing of your father. And at that point, it was like you had sort of lost the will for music for a while. Everything seems to freeze or go downhill for you. You're sleeping in your 1998 Subaru. And then you realize in that moment, you need to change your relationship with yourself. So you pack up and move to Minneapolis. And you said, that's where the music scene is. Now, not everyone knows this, but I'm from Minneapolis. So... Why don't you tell people what is the Minneapolis music scene? Like what? Because most people don't think of Minneapolis as having a great music scene, but it really does. Oh, yeah. And you know what? I didn't even know before moving to Minneapolis there was a music scene. I was told that like um, by a mutual musician who I was joining his band. He was like, he was like, oh, the scene in Minneapolis is is bananas. And I was like, okay, Minneapolis? <laughs> like, is, is it cold there? And, you know, I was a Minneapolis. I would be like, Minneapolis? <laughs> so, um, and it was so, it was, it was funny. I went to South by Southwest that year. And, you know, 
I, when you in Texas, you go to South by Southwest every year. I used to go with a thought and I would go to rap, see rap shows. And I went with my rock band and I'm a veteran at South by Southwest. Band. So anyways, I was there and that year, every single band I met and every person that I had crazy encounters with in the street or got drunk with was from Minneapolis. And I'd be like, oh, this is a cool band. Where are you guys from? They're like, oh, we're from Minneapolis. And I, Minneapolis took over South by Southwest that year. And that was the same year that I was like kind of turning over the idea of moving to the Twin Cities. And I was like, oh, this is just a confirmation to just go. Like all these cool people are from there. You know, I already have friends now. I already made friends in Austin. So I was like, let's go. So I went. And um, the scene is like this. I describe it like this every time. There are tons of incredible bars and venues, and they can all be sold out in one night with local acts alone. Like that yeah. is how incredible the music scene is in Minneapolis. Like there are venues inside of like fucking sports bars, like, we used to play at this bar called cause all the time and they had like just a venue in there and but you could also get mac and cheese with cheese curds like and, <laughs> and get drunk and we would literally play there for food and and liquor like you know you like there and also the music community and the local community had your back you know they would support each other like I was in like 7,000 bands, <laughs> you know, I was playing flute and singing backup for my friend in one band. I was also in another band as just like a rapper. I was in a, a rap collective. I was in a girl group. I had my solo music, like the limit does not exist in Minneapolis. And there was always music happening always really good local music coming out from rap to to experimental to rock um and people would show up to your show and they would support you at your shows it is something like I've never seen before but it's also you know the reason why Prince moved back and lived in Chanhassen and it's the reason why you know uh there are successful touring artists that live in Minneapolis that don't need you know mainstream pop success they can tour you know america and sell out clubs and with their fan base alone because of good music so that was the scene that i came up in and um the way that i joined the minneapolis music scene was so fun and so free and so cool and i have relationships with people that you know will last forever no matter how much time i've spent away from them or not <laughs> And it's where you record your first solo album. Um, after yeah. you've been, you were with a lot of girl groups and bands, like you said, and then My Skin, that's where you said you realized, you know, you're a songwriter. Yeah, I I um I wrote My Skin for Big Girl Small World. I recorded Lizzo Bangers, that was my first project. And then Big Girl Small World was less about just like jotting down raps in a notepad and more about like, listen to the music. You know, you're a musician. You've studied music in college, like, you know, create words that go with the music. Cause I was so in my rap, like how fast can you rap on top of a beat? And then I think I really started to get into my bag with Big Girl Small World. And My Skin was the first song that I wrote because I was moved by something. And um, I wanted to communicate that emotion to people. And I wanted people to feel where I was coming from. And when I was singing that song on stage, it was a song that people would sing back to me immediately without even knowing it and I was like now that is songwriting <laughs> and I'm in a room with probably more Prince records than I can count so I this wasn't covered in the documentary so I'm just going off what I read but from what I read is he saw a documentary or something with you in it and invited you to come record with uh one of his girl groups how is that true and what was your experience meeting Prince like I can't let you get away without your best friend's story. I had a relationship with Paisley Park and Prince and his team. Like it was very much like he thought that I was talented and 
he saw something in me that the world hadn't seen yet and was my first major cosign, which I always feel like, you know, nobody cosigned me. I was like, damn, all these other, cause mind you, people forget that I am a, a female rapper first. You know, I learned how to sing and I got very good at it. And so I'm so good at it that these bitches must have forgot. But I was a female rapper and a lot of the girls that I came up with at the time, which there weren't that many girls that were rapping. Now there's so many. And I'm like, this is a dream. I used to manifest this day. But back then it was only a few of us and they would get co-signed by big rappers. And I just was getting, you know, nothing, no love. And I was like, huh, interesting. And for Prince to be like, Lizzo's the one to watch. Literally his words exactly. And putting me and, um, you know, my friend and partner, Sophia Aris, a partner, sounds like we're <laughs> dating, <laughs> but you know, my DJ on a record and inviting us to perform at Paisley Park so many times, calling us on a dime, being like, hey, come and perform. And, um, was really special and surreal. And um, I don't know, I just feel like that, part of my life feels like a movie but an incredible mentor and one of the best musicians that's ever ever lived i mean i mean ever lived and for yeah. him to think that i was talented and 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 enough to do you know we never did it but to do an album with me like yeah what ah anyway there is um, an emotional moment in the documentary that I thought was interesting. And it's you start breaking down when you listen to Falling by Harry Styles. And I love that relationship between you two. Like you two have like a like a fun friendship going on. What hit you with that song? Like what was going on? What 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 brought you to tears when you heard that song? for the? Was it the first time you heard it? I don't know. No, it was not. I have been consuming the Harry Styles album um, because that we had been working so much at that time that I was so physically and mentally exhausted that I didn't feel like I was even in my body sometimes. Like I, those were the days where my schedule would be 6 a.m. to like midnight every day. And it was back to back interviews, press, performances, shoots, travel, and um music there was I don't listen to a lot of music I'll listen I'm the type of person I'll consume one thing over and over and over and over and at that time it was the um Harry Styles Fine Line album and um I think it's a beautiful song and it's a sad song and it's a good song what made me cry <laughs> was if you watch the film again you'll see I'm crying on the couch and I'm like it's it feels like, you know, I used to love that he didn't need me, you know, um, mm -hmm. because everyone in my life needs me. And, you know, but it hurts when you really think about it, that the one person that you want to need you doesn't even need you. It's like, oh, shit, you don't even need me. You know, the other side of that coin. And I'm sitting there trying to forget about my feelings. And Harry goes... I have the feeling that you'll never need me again. And I was like, oh. <laughs> it was like he was in the room and he like, it, 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 you can't, I'm telling you, man, there's, you can't produce or fake any of these things. It's almost like, you know, when you're watching a reality show and they're like, hey, why'd you close the door? And then like the musical director slides in, why'd you close the door? Like a song that, a song that has like the actual lyric in it. That was what that was. But except we didn't produce it. We didn't add it in post. It really happened like 20 minutes after I had that conversation. And I just lost it. Cause I was like, that is exactly how I feel right now. And um, music is, and that's why I was like, wow, music is really powerful. And my makeup artist goes, you should really go to a Lizzo show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, speaking of Harry, you both had a great year at the Grammys earlier this year. You won record of the year for about the time. First black woman to win record of the year since Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You in 1994, almost 20 years. That can't be lost on you. I mean, what was that moment like for you? It was a surprise. And I love surprises. Um, I love surprises so much that I don't expect 
my expectations are always very like look good feel good get drunk that's that's it and i was like and i want to get a selfie with beyonce so that's why i turned around when beyonce was winning the award and got my selfie though that was my expectation level right and um me and adele were just chatting just drinking just having fun and i really like what a year to be nominated like i i wanted to be nominated in a year with really extremely top of the you know industry people like it's an honor to be like, damn, I'm also nominated next to Beyonce. That that makes me a contemporary, you know, um, next to Adele. Like, what? And, um, but also knowing because I'm in the category with these people, <laughs> you're not taking no trophy home. Your trophy is the fact that you are now on that level and you should celebrate that. Yeah. And so me and Adele was just, do 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 and I don't even know if we knew what the category was because we, we were kind of chatting over stuff. <laughs> and then they said my name. I said, huh? And I looked. I was like, wait. <laughs> and in that moment, it was like, um, damn. And I didn't actually know that the last time a Black woman won an award was Whitney for I Will Always Love You. I also oops didn't know that like the magnitude of record of the year for a songwriter and a producer and an artist is just like I think in the time I was just like another Grammy <laughs> and um there are no words to really describe what you're thinking in that moment you're like oh shit now I gotta get up on the stage on live television in front of millions of people and say something interesting yeah. <laughs> and um it was like what you gonna say and uh I use that as my opportunity to talk to Beyonce and to honor everyone who was a part of the record and I actually don't even remember what else I said because I was so going at the speed of light um yeah but I tell you what after that when I got off the stage that's when people it started coming and they were like Do you know that the last time a black woman won that did you know that this is the only award that this producer has always wanted did you know that you just do you know what this means for you and I'm like huh and I'll tell you what I feel so confident since then I, I don't know what it is I don't know if it was because my performance was so good vocally or I looked it so good I have so much confidence in myself as an artist since then and um it has done it has done very good things for me <laughs> yeah. i mean there's so many different grammy categories and awards but record of the year is the best single record of the year so there is something to be said for that um but i'm running out of time but i want to snack uh, get in here real quick that another surprise for you was that Emmy for best reality series for watch up for the big girls you broke the RuPaul's Drag Race uh, streak so that was another one that you know that that was a, such a great moment to watch and that acceptance speech was phenomenal thank you that was another one that I was you know I'm I'm a fan of RuPaul's Drag I watch the show I consume RuPaul's Drag Race I've been on RuPaul's Drag Race twice and um, I think like the second time I did RuPaul or the first time um, he looked at me and said, you got it, kid. You could do this. I got down. I, I got down on one knee and I and I looked at RuPaul after that, after my speech. And I and I said, I love you so much. I would not have been here or done this without you. Thank you. You know, and um, I was really just proud of the fact that we got all the girls from the cast in the building. <laughs> Cause yeah. that's a hard ticket to get baby. <laughs> yeah. My colleague was sitting up there with them and he said it was just like, everyone was just screaming. He said it was fantastic. Oh. Um, well, let's just put a bow on this. What did this documentary mean for you? What has it been like to put your life out there like this in such a raw way? We knew that something was going to come from it. Some story was going to take shape and, you know, Doug Prey, um, we all have to just give a round of applause for him because 
he found the story over three and a half years of filming uh, question marks, you know, and um, he told the story of where I've come from so beautifully that if anybody ever asks where I come from again, I'm going to defer them to the film. You can watch Love Lizzo streaming on HBO Max right now, bitch. If you got any questions, comments, or concerns about where I come from, nailed it beautifully. Also um, showed the story of the rise of my career and then showed me creating special my album in such a beautiful intimate way um it it is a joy that this piece of documentation exists for me congratulations it's a wonderful film and thanks for sitting down and chatting with gold derby today thank you for having me 